West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com We begin tonight with a debt ceiling deal and the wrath of the pro-default caucus. I am sure you've heard by now that after marathon talks over the weekend, President Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy reached an agreement on a deal to suspend the debt ceiling. Suspend, not raise. That's important, and I will get back to that in a minute. The House is expected to vote on the bill tomorrow. The House Rules Committee met today to vote on whether it will make it to the floor, the first procedural hurdle for the deal. But if you want to know whether the deal itself is any good, take a listen to who's mad about it. The far right House Freedom Caucus. This deal fails, fails completely. And that's why these members and others will be absolutely opposed to the deal and we will do everything in our power to stop it. Be very clear, not one Republican should vote for this deal. It is a bad deal. In short, tomorrow's bill is a bunch of fake news. We're not going to default. We're going to choose. They're going to say this. Let's call their bluff on it. The best deal is no deal. (laughs) Now, it is important to note, those members of the House Freedom Caucus were never going to vote for the debt deal. They said so in advance. It doesn't punch poor people in the face enough like their bill. So it was a no from the jump. In fact, one of those members, Texas's lynching glorifier, Chip Roy, vowed to kill it in the House Rules Committee, calling it a, quote, turd sandwich. The deal doesn't raise the debt limit by a fixed amount. It actually just suspends it until 2025, meaning the Treasury Department can borrow whatever it needs to pay our national bills. And in true Republican Scooby-Doo villain fashion, North Carolina's Dan Bishop said the quiet part way loud (laughs) about that. It removes the issue from the national conversation during the presidential election to come. How could you more successfully kneecap any Republican president than to take that issue out of his or her hands? Okay, again, these people said in advance that they wouldn't vote for any deal. So now that they got the nothing that you're entitled to when you promise not to vote for anything, they're just being honest about why. Bishop also became the first Republican to openly call for Speaker Kevin McCarthy's job over the agreement. He told Politico, the one person motion to vacate should absolutely be on the table to oust McCarthy. It has to happen, he said. That was also always going to happen (laughs) after Kevin McCarthy sold his soul to the pro-default caucus to get the 15 votes that he needed to grasp the speaker's gavel. But while Kevin, you know, isn't exactly the brightest light in the candelabra, If he has made this deal with President Biden, it stands to reason that he also made a deal with enough Republicans and Democrats to vote for it and for him in a no confidence vote. And because it's a negotiated deal, not everyone got everything they wanted. But there are a lot of clear wins for President Biden. 
Republicans will call new work requirements a victory, even though work requirements for SNAP food aid are currently federal law for people under 50 with no dependents. The deal extends the age from 49 to 54. But veterans and the homeless are exempted from the new work requirements, which the White House says would likely offset the increased age limits, leaving the number of adults subject to the work requirements unchanged. Republicans are also crowing that the deal cut spending by limiting non-defense spending. But what they actually got is spending that will remain roughly flat for the next two years. And they can go home and tout increased defense spending of a whopping $866 billion, which was already President Biden's budget request. And Republicans can tell their mean-spirited little base that, you know, they didn't raise the debt limit because suspend means it just went away like the wind. But cry more, MAGA Republicans, because the reality is you didn't get what you wanted, but everyone had to give a little. And that is how deals and adulting work. And it turns out President Biden is really, really good at this. If you're old enough to remember 2011, the first time Republicans used the threat of default to hold our economy hostage under President Barack Obama and got the U.S. its first credit downgrade in the process, that deal to save us from default was brokered by, drum roll, none other than Vice President Joe Biden. And while then Speaker John Boehner portrayed it as an own the libs win for Republicans, at the time, officials said Boehner ultimately didn't get much. Joining me now is David Pluff, former Obama campaign manager and MSNBC political analyst, and Sahil Kapoor, NBC News senior national political reporter. Um, let's start with what's in this deal. I'm just going to put it up. Suspends the debt ceiling for two years, meaning it will not be an issue, as Re- Republican Scooby-Doo villain uh, admitted. Cap spending for two years at 2023 levels. Claws back unspent COVID funds, meaning money that's just sitting there gets clawed back. Restart student loan payments at these work requirements, except veterans, the homeless, and people aging out of foster care. It cuts the IRS's budget, and it does permit some energy, uh, ener- uh, sort of permitting for energy and fully funds veterans' medical care. What are Democrats and the Republicans who actually were in play to actually vote for this actually saying about this style? Well, Joy, the spending cuts are too modest for some House Freedom Caucus Republicans. This was always going to be the case. They were barely satisfied with a much more aggressive bill that House Republicans passed on a party line basis. They were never going to be on board for a compromise. They were always going to vote no. The question uh, for Kevin McCarthy, for the speaker, was can he minimize those losses and get the vast majority of his Republican conference on board? We will find out what the answer to that is. But so far, so good for him. His leadership team is projecting confidence. A lot of members outside the Freedom Caucus we spoke to Uh, also say they're on board with this. They're trying to focus on what's in the bill. Republicans who are focusing on what's in the bill, uh, you know, are more supportive of it. And the House Republicans who are uh, focusing on what's not in the bill, all these steeper cuts that they wanted are voting against it. We'll see where the numbers break down tomorrow, Joy, but we know uh, House Democratic leader Hakeem Jeffries has said he expects 150 Republicans to support it. That is two thirds of the conference. Democrats do not want to carry this over the line themselves. This was a deal that, of course, they were not in the room for it. It was House Republican leaders and the White House in the room. They believe it's the job of the House majority to carry it over the line. Progressives have also expressed some concerns with this. But at the end of the day, Joy, I think Democrats have so much invested in this. Economically, they want to prevent a catastrophic uh, default. And politically, they're invested in President Biden's success. They need him to be successful in order for themselves to be successful. And they're not going to let this fail. Uh, This bill is in decent shape to pass the House. And then it goes over to the Senate with just about five days or so if it passes tomorrow yeah. before that crucial deadline. So, so these are the members of the, of the Rules Committee. They're trying to sort of hold it up in the Rules Committee. Uh, Thomas Massey, who's indicated he's going to vote for it. Ralph Norman, Chip Roy. Um, those are the sort of problem members, um, Sahil. Any of those members seem like they're going to jump ship and, and prevent it from getting out of rules? Well, right now, the Rules Committee has nine Republicans and four Democrats. So let's just keep the Democrats aside for one moment and see if seven out of those nine Republicans vote for it. That is the majority. Thomas Massey appears to be a yes. And there are uh, six other McCarthy allies whose votes were never really in question. So this bill is in good shape to get out of the Rules Committee, whether or not Democrats vote uh, for it. The, the tradition around here is that typically the majority party has to carry these procedural votes in committees. So even though a lot of Democrats are going to vote for it on the floor of the House, some of them might vote against the procedural rule to go forward. But. 
you know, Chip Roy and, and Ralph Norman are also on the Rules Committee. They yeah. are, are very critical of this bill. They can vote against it, and it still uh, would have uh, the votes to pass just on Republican strength, Joy. Yeah, and, and you know what? I'm going to say, so what, David Pluff, as I come over to you? If you literally say, I will never vote for anything, there's nothing that you could put in a bill that I will ever vote for, you're literally iced out of the conversation. So that was a dumb strategy to begin with. But I, I do want to go to this sort of, they sort of have it both ways thing. So Nancy Mays, this was her quote. She said uh, she doesn't like the bill either. She says she's not going to vote for it. She goes back and forth between being a normie and a MAGA. She says, I'm voting no on the debt ceiling debacle because playing with the D.C. game isn't worth selling out our kids and grandkids. Republicans got outsmarted by a president who can't find his pants. So let's just say, let's just say she's right. Let's just pretend you know Biden, so you know he can find his pants. But let's say he didn't. And he's pantsless in the White House right now, doesn't know where they're at. He still beat them. What does that say about them if they believe that he is mentally incontinent, but he's still beating them at this game? That means to me that they are completely irrelevant and they, they don't know what they're doing. They're literally insulting themselves, trying to insult him. He beat them again. Your thoughts, David Plouffe? Well, they're just not serious about governing most of them. Uh, and listen, Biden, I was in the rooms with him in 2011 when he was talking to McConnell and Boehner and Democrats. Uh, because we got very close to defaulting back then. So I think, listen, this is really not on the level. So the people who are criticizing, we're never going to vote for it. This isn't the type of thing that's going to get 300 votes in the House. It'll get 218, 220, 222. McCarthy and Jeffries probably have all this wired no matter what press releases and, and outbursts happen. Uh, and at the end of the day, the big thing, the specifics matter, but the big thing is the country's not going to default, <laughs> which is most importantly, uh, from an economic and substance standpoint, sure. this is already a pretty big economy, and we could head into a severe recession, if not a depression. Uh, and then politically, uh, the truth is the House Republicans have a very narrow majority. It's under threat. I'm sure most of the vulnerable Republicans in the House did not want default. Obviously, the White House doesn't want default. Senate, you know, members who are in tough races don't want default. So the, the big thing to me is the substance before the politics, which is, and that's what scared me all along, is there's too many Republicans who believe default. They either don't believe it's actually default, it's not real, it's fake, it's like right. a government shutdown. And of course, it, those two things cannot be further from each other. So the good news is now, of course, we're going to have this debate again in 25 and 27. And at some point, we've got to stop having this ridiculous debate and handle this like every American family or business does, which is we pay the bills that we rack up without yeah. any extra drama or debate. But I think that's where we're heading. And, and Biden, listen, I think he knew that the, this economy could not withstand a shock like a default, even if it was a temporary one. Uh, and he had to make some concessions to make sure that didn't happen. I think they were smart concessions. But once again, he shows that he's kind of a master of the inside game. It is Wednesday, the 31st of May of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little Yorkie is our door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our very special daily special, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us of these meddlesome priests? No one. Yes, it's always plural here. Uh, a little different than in the original uh, Beckett, where it was only one priest, that old tool who was trying to uh, rid himself of. And that would be, well, Beckett. But here, in today's new Agogo society, it's many priests. And they come in all forms and functions, and they all have one goal. And you know what that is. Yes, yes. Now, I don't know, maybe Beckett was a, uh, I don't know, he was actually kind of a likable creature, but still, in today's New York go -Go society, those who prop themselves up as priests, uh, you might want to, you know, see how much tax-exempt income they have. Oh, yeah, lots. Private jets. Eh, write it off. Religious expense. I got this jet so I could be closer to God. Well, isn't God omnipresent so it doesn't matter whether you're under the ground or 10 miles high? It used to be 8 miles high, but technology has advanced. Let's go 10. 
All right. Well, you're here uh, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy where everything is game and one nonlinear rant. Yeah, follow that. Okay. Actually, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we sometimes keep them in that order. Sometimes the ending comes in the middle, and sometimes the middle is at the beginning, and sometimes it gets all like, uh, you know, uh, the shell game. Where is that P? All right. Well, um, I wanted to start off with this uh, death ceiling imbroglio, completely manufactured by... <laughs> I don't know the seditious caucus. They are the sedition caucus. Insurgents, actually. They're beyond sedition. Are they? Maybe they're one and the same. Well, or maybe we can link them up and say they're both. Anyway, those who are tasked with destroying the United States of America, do you really think they care about the good faith and credit of such? I don't. So, uh,. They're out there with all their bluster saying it's the worst thing that could ever happen. Well, yeah, because <laughs> the very existence of representative democracy and all that entails is a threat to their their well-being. And their well-being is much more important than the United States of America, apparently. So, we have a president who... Apparently can't find his pants, according to them, and they're high on their supply. Because it looks to me like Joe Biden beat the pants off them. See what I did there? I did it. I did it. And he did. And they're still whining about it. Where's my pants? <laughs> I can't find my pants. Joe Biden took them. Damn right. All right. So, uh, that's what you get. Joe uh, legislated for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And he learned from, uh, you know, some, uh, I don't know, the old, uh, the old kind of uh, representative on the grounds. Retail democracy and all that entailed. Tanami Hall this. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> he knows the ins and outs, and uh, these people are just learning this stuff, and they think it's, oh, let's try this. No one's ever done this before. And Joe Biden goes, give me a break. All right. They have no intention, when I say they, I mean with a ta capital T, they... They have no intention of negotiating in good faith because they don't believe in good faith. They only believe in whatever means that ends up in them being on top. And then they get to tell us about morality. Did you see where Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene and her new boyfriend are complaining about people's sex lives? Both of them cheated on their spouses so they, they could get together. And I'm like, oh, my God, this is the master race. And they're going to propagate that It was bad enough when they were just in with their separate uh, families. Now they're going to do it. They're going to like have a hybrid. Oh, my God. Maybe she's too old. She's 50 now. I don't think she's going to be uh, having a baby anytime soon. But still. Why do we have to have these sexual deviants pushing their sex lives in our faces, telling us, well, you know, you know what they're saying. <sighs> you know, we were taught way back, because you don't judge other people's sex lives, because if you open up your own bedroom, it's going to be opened up to ridicule, too. No one likes that. Do not turn a camera on your butt. That's what I always say. And then, if you do, don't put it out there for the world to see. I can't stand looking at my butt. Especially now. <laughs> so, TikTok this. Uh-huh. Well, I don't know. Anyway, uh, so Joe, Joe uh, took them to the woodshed, as they say. Yeah, I know. We uh, 
didn't get everything that we wanted and some aspects of this uh this agreement this negotiated agreement is that yeah the poor people get kicked in the ass once again yeah you'll you know how it is to live there so you know, you know a little more time won't, won't matter i don't think it's that cynical or maybe it is but i am assured that once we have this I don't know, hostage taking, uh, negotiated and appeased uh, and taken care of, all of that, that uh, the concessions that we made uh, will be uh, somewhat overturned. And he did overturn them. I mean, look at the SNAP benefits. More people are going to get food stamps now. They don't call it that, but you know what I mean. And uh, that's because Joe McCarthy, Joe McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy is an idiot. Joe McCarthy was an idiot too, but Kevin McCarthy is a real idiot. They all are. Otherwise, they wouldn't be where they are. If you don't have any moral compass, I guess anything that you do is okay. All right. And then they complain about us not being able to have any control over our lives and behavior. I just hate it. That's why I was a punk. (sighs) We're not hippies. Hippies get kicked. Punks kick Punch the Nazis. And that's what we're going to be talking about here in a bit, too, here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy on this fine, smothered Benedict Wednesdays. It's really just a lovely, velvety holiday sauce over an equally lovely uh, egg dish. So there. Properly cooked, too, with just enough of the runny stuff. Mm hmm. Anyway. What do we have in store for you in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy today? Well, a black man was kicked out of the white nationalist-dominated Shasta County, California Board of Supervisors meeting when he complained about a white speaker using the N-word. The white N-word spewing uh, bigot gets to stay. And uh, the black guy was summarily escorted out by private security hired just for you know, the, the, the possibility that some black guy, one of the few in Shasta County, might show up and complain about them using the N-word in their meetings. Okay. We've come a long ways, haven't we? Ron DeSantis is attempting to create the Army of the Confederacy. That's how far we've come. And those, and this is actually good news, those who harass, intimidate, or use force on election workers performing their duties in Nevada could soon face up to four years in prison. Is that enough? Well, it's a start. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Greece's education ministry has been targeted in a cyber attack described as the most extensive in the country's history. And NATO is sending 700 more troops to Kosovo to help the violent protests there. And no, we're not in the 90s. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. At netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln, and we thank her for doing so. Across the page to the left from that chat room link, 
monitored by Kelly Lincoln, is the uh, link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford to send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink, for instance, if you could afford to send us those funds once a month, it really helps us pay our bills and the accumulated costs that it takes to run this powerhouse of resistance. So thank you for your generosity to those of you who have helped us do so over all these many years. And uh, thank you to those of you who might consider being so generous in the near future. Thank you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. And he's also, uh, we're pretty much migrating out of Twitter because it has become even more of a cesspool. Toxic. Uh, I, I might stick around. I don't know. We'll see. But anyway, you can also find me on uh, Twitter, Mastodon and Spoutable, at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And you can find all of the show notes and links diaries by going to my social media feeds because the links to get them are right there. There they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All right, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by David Benda from the Shasta Record Searchlight. A black man was kicked out of Tuesday's Shasta County Board of Supervisors meeting after he objected to a white speaker using the N-word while addressing the five-member board. Nathan Pickney was escorted from the chamber by a Securitas security guard after board chair Patrick Jones got upset with him for speaking out from a seat in the audience. The man who used the slur, frequent board attendee Alex Balecki, was not chastised. Jeff Gorder, who retired as Shasta County Public Defender in 2018, scolded Jones for not stopping Balecki from talking. The constitutional right of free speech is not unlimited. You can't yell fire in this crowded room or disturbing the peace to use offensive words that are likely to result in a violent action. You can't tolerate that kind of language here. You should gavel that down and shut it down, Gorder said. During a presentation on the potential to build tiny homes in Shasta County, Pickney got angry when Balecki used the N-word while stating his opposition to tiny homes. So I got very angry. I yelled at him. I told him to get the F out, and then I ended up leaving to get some air, get some space, and calm down, and went back into the meeting. Pickney told reporters soon after he had been kicked out of the meeting room. And then Patrick Jones goes and defends his First Amendment right basically says that there's nothing wrong with him saying the N-word and using that type of hate speech, that type of rhetoric, Pickney said. After the meeting, Jones reiterated to the record searchlight that removing Balecki from the meeting or turning off his mic would have violated his First Amendment right. People have constitutional rights, and I, as board chair, will protect those rights. I do not like the F-word. I do not like the N-word. But under the Constitution, they are protected. Oh, really? Jones saw it differently for Pickney. Mr. Pickney chose to speak out, yell out from the board floor, which is in violation of our policy. I asked him to refrain from doing so. He was being disruptive. He did not, and so I had security remove him, which I will do again if his behavior continues. Jones told the record searchlight after the meeting ended. Balecki returned to the podium while the board still was holding its open comment period and attempted to explain himself. Some left the chamber saying they could not believe the board was allowing him to speak again. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You guys didn't like my first speech, so I'm going to try to trim it down, Balecki said in a accent totally made up for the moment. When it comes to your house, when it comes to where you live, crime is a matter. It's a simple matter. When they put a ten-foot little house next to your quarter-million house, everything diminishes. I don't like somebody coming into my pocket and taking my house and my values away. That's why I spoke. And as for being prejudiced, it ain't that way. Well, that's what they all say. Supervisors Mary Rickett and Tim Garman spoke out during the meeting, calling Balecki's comment inappropriate and offensive and apologizing for it. After the meeting, Rickert told the record searchlight that she was upset with the way Jones handled the situation, and she said Balecki should be banned from future meetings. She said the lack of civility and respect for people during supervisors' meetings has deteriorated over the last three years. Funny, that's when the My Pillow guys started funding the takeover of the County Board of Supervisors. Burris of Raw Story brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is attempting to create the Army of the Confederacy, according to an Iraq War veteran, veteran advocate and founder of Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, Paul Rykoff, cast DeSantis' war, uh, war on wokeism in the military as an effort to rebuild the military with only white straight men. Welcoming the panel on Tuesday following Memorial Day yesterday, MSNBC host Nicole Wallace could not fathom why a Republican politician would be going after the military or suddenly opposing the military because they accept LGBTQ plus or women and people of color into the armed forces and reserves. It's not going to win him a general election, that is for sure. I think that the GOP have become farther and farther right. The middle seems to be gone, said Rykoff. He, he explained that it might be popular among the far right to attack any institution that is embracing equality. I think it is a losing general election strategy. Republicans complained in February that DeSantis was overstepping in his war against equality. Wallace asked if the military was considered woke, but Rykoff said it's only progressive in the sense that it is always evolving. We talked about this last week with regard to Tommy Tuberville, he continued. It sounds like they want to create the Army of the Confederacy. Yeah, the Army now allows in women, and it is no longer all white, and it is moving forward, and that seems to be what they are attacking. I think they are making a really big political miscalculation about tacking the military. They are not going after Joe Biden. They are going after the military, and that is one of the few institutions that has a high popularity rating. I think they are continuing to drive independence away.
of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Those who harass, intimidate, or use force on election workers performing their duties in Nevada could soon face up to four years in prison under a new law by the Western Swing State's Republican governor yesterday, Tuesday. The law is meant to deter attacks against those in state and local election offices who have faced increased scrutiny for doing their jobs. Democratic Secretary of State Cisco Aguilar said threats and intimidation of election workers have ramped up significantly in Nevada and across the country amid falsehoods and conspiracy theories about foul play, denying former President Trump his victory in the 2020 presidential race. Other states have taken similar steps to protect election officials in recent years, including Maine, Vermont, Washington, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. The bill passed unanimously through both chambers of Nevada's Democratic-controlled legislature was a core promise from Aguilar, who cited an exodus of election workers across the state due in part to increased threats. And we know who have been making those threats. The law also makes it a felony to disseminate personal information about an election worker without their consent. Well, good. That takes us to our break, so why don't we do so? And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, friends and family, fast style. Fast and Furious 10, which has been dubbed Fast X, comes to us some 22 years after the first one and finds the formula intact. Vin Diesel's Dominic Toro and his multi-ethnic band of street-fighting motorheads and bikers get an enemy to fight, and the rest sort of just happens. How many of the details of their familial and other relationships or previous adventures you need to remember to follow along here is a question, just as it is with many franchises. The antagonist here, Dante Reyes, is drawn from FNF five and is the son of the bad guy the crew took out in that one played by jason moma his character is one of the bright spots here of course he's the epitome of evil but he's also a hilarious mashup of the joker and liberace a foppish sociopath dressed in pastels who giggles as he kills and no look at this one would be complete without mentioning the vehicles along with staples like dom's 1970 dodge charger rt the fan-beloved Orange and Black Special Edition Mazda RX-7 from Tokyo Drift. Here, for the first time in a movie like this, we get a look at all-electric muscle cars, including a Dodge 2024 Charger Daytona and a DeLorean Alpha 5. And then, of course, there are the motorcycles. Is Tom's family first routine getting cliched? Sure. Do the stunts conform with the laws of physics? Not so much. Are some of the sidebars there just to continue the sagas of previous characters, thus contributing to its 160-minute running time? Probably, but the huge ensemble cast is having a great time, and you will too as Fast X Part 1 rocks right up to its cliffhanger end where you'll be perched till 2025's next installment. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at Take-TwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. And welcome to Your Health Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. On this show, we highlight the latest vital health news, discoveries that affect your body and your mind. Every episode, we dive into one topic. We discuss diseases, treatments, and some controversies. And we demystify the medical research in ways you can use to stay healthy. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We're Scientific American Senior Health Editors. Today, we're talking about coffee. 
we hear a lot of conflicting findings about whether our favorite beverage is good or bad for our health. But recently, an especially rigorous study came out that may finally answer some of our percolating questions. There's a good chance that right now you're sipping the very thing we're talking about, coffee. It is one of the most widely consumed beverages in the entire world. It's true. Here in the U.S., the average person drank almost 89 gallons of coffee in 2016, more than soda, tea, and juice combined. That's a lot of java, or joe, brew, or jitter juice, whatever you like to call it. Indeed. Do you drink coffee, Josh? Actually, I guess I'm one of the few people who doesn't. I used to guzzle it, though, about four to five cups a day. But I gave it up a few years ago. Why? What happened? Honestly, my stomach started getting upset. I figured I could do without so much acid, you know? That totally makes sense. But personally, I'm not really functional until I've had my morning cup of coffee. And I don't know if I could give that up. There are times when I catch the aroma from a coffee shop and it just smells so good. But listen, I'm still not sure that coffee was causing my problems. It feels like every day there's a new study telling us coffee is good for us or bad for us for a whole bunch of different reasons. With all these conflicting messages, it can really feel like whiplash. Well, it turns out it's actually really hard to study how coffee or any other food or drink affects our health. Most nutrition studies are observational studies, which compare health outcomes in people who, say, happen to drink coffee to those who don't. But it's impossible to rule out other variables that could affect what you're trying to measure. Plus, you have to rely on people reporting what they consumed weeks or months after they drank it. And most of us can't even remember what we had for breakfast. So what's the solution? Is there another way to study this? Well, there is a way to be more objective. I talked to... Gregory Marcus, uh, professor of medicine and cardiologist at University of California, San Francisco. Marcus and his colleagues took a different approach than most other coffee studies. Instead of just studying people who drank coffee or didn't, he set up a randomized trial to study coffee's impact on your heartbeat. They were looking for abnormal heart rhythms called arrhythmias. The topic comes up very frequently in my clinic, where patients with various arrhythmias uh, will ask if they can consume coffee. There's this conventional wisdom that coffee increases the risk for heart rhythm disturbances or electrical problems with the heart, which is my clinical subspecialty. And yet we and others in conducting recent observational studies generally have failed to find a clear association between coffee and arrhythmias. In their new study, Marcus and his colleagues randomly assigned 100 people to either drink or not drink coffee each day for a period of two weeks. And they received these instructions via text message. They were randomly assigned to either go ahead and drink all the coffee you want versus on other random days, avoid all caffeine today. They had participants wear a heart monitor, a Fitbit, and a continuous glucose monitor. They also had them download an app on their phone that collected GPS location data so the researchers could see when people were actually visiting coffee shops. With the heart monitors, what were they looking at? They were measuring two things. The number of what are called premature atrial contractions and premature ventricular contractions. It's very common for everyone to have an early beat arising from the upper chambers of the heart called premature atrial contractions or PACs once in a while. But research has shown that having too many of these beats puts you at risk of atrial fibrillation, which is a dangerously irregular rapid heartbeat. This is associated with a very high risk for stroke, dementia, and death. Then there's the other kind of irregular heartbeat. Premature ventricular contractions are early beats that arise from the lower chambers of the heart. Again, we all have those sometimes, uh, but those with more are at higher risk of developing heart failure or weakening of the heart. They found that drinking coffee did not result in more premature atrial contractions, the early heartbeats associated with atrial fibrillation. That's good news for people who are worried about that. That is reassuring. But what about the other bad beats, the premature contractions in the heart's lower chambers? Those were slightly more common on days when people were told to drink coffee, or on days when they drank more coffee, but not enough to be really worrisome. And that's not all they found. 
coffee consumption was also associated with a higher number of daily steps. On days when people drank coffee, and the more coffee they drank, the more steps they took. On days randomized to coffee, people took on average about a thousand more steps, which is highly significant. And in fact, that difference in average steps has been associated with the improved uh, longevity uh, in large epidemiologic studies. The study couldn't show why people increased their steps on days when they drank coffee. Maybe they were just walking to the coffee shop or the bathroom more. But regardless, an extra 1,000 steps per day has been linked to a 6 to 15% lower risk of death in other studies. So coffee might actually make people perk up and move around. Yep, I guess the coffee drinkers were full of beans. But there was a downside to drinking coffee, and it probably won't surprise you. Uh, let me guess. People slept less. Bingo. The study participants got about half an hour less sleep on average on the days they drank coffee compared with the days they didn't. But the results varied a lot from person to person depending on whether they were fast or slow coffee metabolizers, which is determined by your genetics. The researchers gave participants a genetic saliva test to determine which type of coffee metabolizer they were. The fast caffeine metabolizers, as inferred from their genetics, actually exhibited no significant relationship between coffee consumption and sleep, whereas the slow caffeine metabolizers exhibited the worst effects on, on sleep. In fact, the slow caffeine metabolizers on, on average uh, had almost an hour less sleep when they were exposed to coffee. I never had an issue with sleep when I was drinking a lot of coffee, but I wake up at a ridiculously early hour in the morning. I'm talking five o'clock, so I'm usually zonked by 10 p.m. anyway. Yeah, I don't usually find that coffee keeps me up at night either, but I try not to have caffeine after about 3 or 4 p.m. Still, this study has me wondering if I should quit drinking it earlier in the day. If someone suffers from insomnia, we have found here in a randomized trial that there's, there are meaningful effects on sleep to such a degree that it really should motivate a good trial off of coffee to really try to tackle insomnia. Okay, that part is pretty much a no-brainer. But overall, the study does seem like fairly positive news for those who enjoy their brew. Yeah, it is pretty good news. It confirms other observational studies that have not shown a higher risk of heart arrhythmias. And some studies have shown that drinking coffee is linked with a lower lifetime risk of diabetes and death overall, which could be a result of the higher activity levels that drinking coffee might produce. In the end, there may not be a simple answer to the question of whether coffee is good or bad for you. It depends on how much you consume, and each person is different. On the whole, these data should be generally reassuring regarding the safety of coffee. But one of the challenges in conducting nutrition-based research is that there tends to be a kind of a natural hunger, especially from the media, but I think this is just human nature, to conclude, okay, is this good for me or is this bad for me? Which one is it? It's one or the other. And the reality is that the effects of coffee are complicated. Coffee affects each person differently. So if drinking coffee makes you feel bad, skip it. But if, like me, you enjoy it in moderation, Go ahead and have that latte. Your Health Quickly is produced and edited by Kelso Harper, Talika Bowes, and Jeff Del Vizio. Our music is composed by Dominic Smith. Our show is part of Scientific American's podcast, Science Quickly. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to go to Siam.com for updated and in-depth health news. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. We'll be back in two weeks. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. Oh, 
On this day in labor history, the year was 1987. That was the day that Rose Will Monroe, one of the women who came to be known as Rosie the Riveter, died in Clarksville, Indiana. She was 77 years old. Rose had gone to work in a factory making B-52 bombers in Ypsilanti, Michigan during World War II. She was one of thousands of women in the United States who entered the industrial workforce to support the war effort, while more and more men entered the armed forces. While Rose Will Monroe worked at the factory, the image of Rosie the Riveter was already becoming perhaps one of the most iconic symbols of U.S. labor. The nickname Rosie the Riveter was first used in a song in 1942. The song was inspired by another real-life Rosie. Rosalind P. Walter worked during the war building Corsair fighter planes. Along with the song, a popular poster showed Rosie with a red kerchief tied around her hair, sleeves rolled up, arm muscles flexed, showing the strength of women workers. We Can Do It was emblazed across the top of the poster. Then, an actor by the name of Walter Pigeon visited the Ypsilanti factory. He was helping to make a promotional film to support the war effort at home. When he found out there was a real Rosie who worked as a riveter in the plant, he recruited her for the film. The image of Rosie the Riveter lives on as a symbol of labor and women's empowerment. All the day long, where the rain or shine, she's the part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for the Victory, Rosie, the Riveter, keeps a sharp lookout for sabotage, sitting up there on the fuselage, that little friend can do more than a male can do, Rosie. The Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 53 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of only about 74 or 75 today, considerably cooler than what it was yesterday. Mostly cloudy conditions throughout the day with winds out of the north-northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour, so a little bit of a scouring. Mainly clear skies tonight with lows in the mid-40s, winds out of the northwest at a scouring 10 to 15 miles per hour. Then partly cloudy skies tomorrow, highs in the mid to upper 70s, winds out of the north-northwest decreasing to their normal 5 to 10 miles per hour for this time of year. Grass pollen is rated very high here in our little hamlet of Rogue River, Oregon. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 19 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is very high at level 8. So take care. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.06 inches. Visibility is at 8 miles. And relative humidity is at 72%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that's why it is known and is the Weather Underground. London is 65 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 80 degrees and sunny. Rome is 76 degrees with rain and a flood advisory. Kiev is 71 and fair. Kabul is 60 degrees and cloudy. Hong Kong is 86 and fair. Tokyo is 64 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 53 degrees and cloudy. And New York, New York 
is 68 degrees Fahrenheit and fair. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Associated Press staff brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Greece's education ministry says it has been targeted in a cyber attack described as the most extensive in the country's history aimed at disabling a centralized high school examination platform. It said the... Distributed denial-of-service attacks aimed at overwhelming the platform occurred for a second consecutive day yesterday, Tuesday. The attack involved computers from 114 countries, causing outages and delays in high school exams, but failing to incapacitate the system. The ministry said the cyber attacks prompted a judicial investigation ordered by a Supreme Court prosecutor to be assisted by the police's cybercrime division. It is the most significant attack ever carried out against a Greek public or government organization, the education ministry said, describing the incidents on Monday and Tuesday as large scale and of sustained duration. End-of-year high school exams in Greece are administered using an online platform known as the Subject Bank, designed to set a uniform standard nationwide. The outages left students waiting in classrooms for hours for the exams to start and touched off a political spat following an inconclusive general election earlier this month. A caretaker government has been appointed ahead of a new election on June 25th with the conservative New Democracy Party, which headed the previous government a favorite to win re-election. Caretaker Prime Minister Ionis Sarmis chaired a meeting yesterday Tuesday on the attacks, which a statement from his office said were of great intensity and indicate a strong motive and know-how. But the statement made no reference to who might be responsible for the disruption. It said the attacks had been efficiently repelled and Greek authorities would, if necessary, mobilize whatever is needed to address cyber attacks in the immediate future. Je te donne, c'est mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Zanel Zini Patuku and Lazar Samini of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. NATO will send 700 more troops to northern Kosovo to help quell violent protests after clashes with ethnic Serbs there left 30 international soldiers wounded. The latest violence in the region has stirred fear of a renewal of the 1998-99 conflict in Kosovo 
blow that claimed more than 10,000 lives, left more than 1 million people homeless, and resulted in a NATO peacekeeping mission that has lasted nearly a quarter of a century. 10,000 is a gross underestimate of lives lost, by the way. The clashes grew out of a confrontation that unfolded last week after ethnic Albanian officials elected in votes overwhelmingly boycotted by Serbs entered municipal buildings to take office. When Serbs tried to block them, Kosovo police fired tear gas to disperse the crowd. More violence followed on Monday when Serbs clashed with police and NATO peacekeepers. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg said an additional reserve battalion would be put on high readiness in case additional troops are needed. These are prudent steps, said Stoltenberg, who made the announcement in Oslo after talks with the Norwegian Prime Minister. The NATO-led peacekeeping mission in the region is known as K4 and currently consists of almost 3,800 troops. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver